Well, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I begin, I will, I think I, I will start. Um, well, welcome everyone. This is um, our first workshop for 2020 uh, to be a certified archivist. What does it take? So on behalf of the Society of Southwest Archivists and the Academy of Certified Archivists, thank you for joining us today. I am uh, Max Prudhomme, the Vice Chair of the Professional Development Committee, um, and um, I will be moderating uh, today's workshop. So we'll be recording the presentation portion of this workshop only and make the recording available on the SSA YouTube channel afterwards. Um, if any of you as a participant is included, um, we will make sure to edit that content out and or reach out to you for permission. Um, if you have any questions about the recording, please um, reach out to me and um, I will enter the, my email shortly in the chat. And um, all participants will be muted during the presentation. And please use the chat for questions uh, during the presentation. And we will go over any questions you may have after the presentations when um, we can unmute. So we want to thank slide two, please. We want to thank um, our sponsor for this workshop, the San Jose State University School of Information, the I E Y E schools exclusively only masters of archives and records administration program includes 15 courses that are pre-approved by the Academy of Certified Archivists. That means you will be that much closer to certification when you graduate. So apply now for admission in fall 2020. Several scholarships valued up to $3,000 are available to newly admitted students. Visit I, E Y E, it spells ischool.sjsu.edu. Now, please allow me to introduce our speaker today, Joshua Kitchens. Joshua Kitchens is the director of the Clayton State University Archival Study Pro Studies Program and the Regent for Outreach at the Academy of Certified Archivists. He's going to talk about the benefits and requirements of becoming a certified archivist. Joshua, I'm turning it over, you, uh, over to you. Thanks, Max. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk about uh, the Academy. Um, I'll try to, throughout the presentation, share sort of my personal experience with the Academy. I've been a member since um, 2011, um, not long after I got into uh, my first archival job, or real super professional archival job, um, which used to be at a university called Georgia College, which is located in a more rural part of the state, but was the state's public liberal arts uh, university. And I think I've had a lot of benefits from being in the academy, but uh, many of those benefits have just become uh, from being directly involved with it uh, over the last few years. So I'm going to talk through a lot of different things about what the Academy does. And we'll talk through, yes, we're going to talk about the exam, but I kind of also want to make a plug for some of the other things that I think are really important about being a member of the Academy beyond just the exam, because the exam is really just the first stage. And a part of this is sort of related to our mission as the academy. And one of the things we're really trying to do is make our profession the best profession that it possibly can be. And I'll explain kind of how we do that both through for, through the examination process, but then the recertification process that all members go through um, on, a, on a rotating schedule. Uh, we also sit out there and allow ourselves as kind of the academy and with our diverse membership and asking questions of the field, kind of think about what it means to be an archivist. And while there's a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different approaches to it, one of the things we're trying to do is just sort of create some guidelines and ways of thinking about the work of archives uh, that all of us do, uh, so we can kind of have some common language, some common ways of thinking about it. And then last but certainly not least, we're really focusing on 
kind of encouraging our members just to be the best archival worker, the best supporter of archives, the best advocate of archives they possibly can be. And I'll kind of talk about how we do that a little bit. A uh, quick note on sort of our history. Uh, we've been around since 1987 um, with sort of a beginning conversations with SAA. Uh, we were founded in 89. And right now we, uh, in 2009, we reached a milestone of 1,000 members. Right now we're approaching closer towards 2,000. Uh, and this includes not just members from the US. One thing we found is that we have a burgeoning international membership. Uh, specifically, we've got a really great uh, cadre of members in Hong Kong, and we've been trying to do some outreach to them um, with all the time differences and, and, and other things. And that's actually been a really great uh, experience for us as the Academy is to be, in, be able to engage with our international members uh, as well. So a couple of quick notes on kind of how we function. Uh, we have what we call our regents. Really, our uh, uh, regents are sort of people responsible for particular pieces that are a part of uh, the way the academy works. Uh, we also have a traditional board makeup of president, vice president, treasurer, and, and secretary. I am the regent for outreach. My job is to reach out. Uh, so I do a lot of different things, such as talk to different groups about why it's important to be certified. Um, I also help a little bit with um, some of our exam uh, prep um, workshops. We're going to be doing a series of, I call them study groups, but really it's me trying to help uh, everyone sort of think about how you'd go about studying, because I know many people, when they're taking the exam, are either just about to finish grad school or have been in, a, been in the field for a number of years, and maybe we need a refresher on how to think about studying and study prep and, and other issues sort of related around just digging into the large body of knowledge that is archival work. Uh, some of our others uh, do things such as prepare the questions that go on the exam, um, help our members maintain their uh, certification. Uh, we also have a new region of member services. Uh, uh, Michelle, she's really great and doing a lot of really great things for our members, including uh, beginning a mentor group, uh, considering some educational opportunities for our members, uh, along with many, many, many different things uh, to add value to the membership of being a member of the Academy. And then we have, of course, have people who help with nominations, like many groups. Uh, and then we have a regent who's just responsible for making sure the exam process is as smooth as possible. A uh, couple of other people we do, we do a lot of different things, uh, including um, we have a secretariat, someone who's professional, who takes care of our business for us. So that means that we can have some really uh, quick turnaround. We also do task force and committees. Uh, for instance, right now, we are in the middle of a rebranding process. Uh, when I came on in as, as a, a regent for outreach, I sort of noticed uh, we didn't have a color scheme, we didn't have a good brand identity, and also we really wanted to be able to tell people why the Academy is so important and why we think that it would add value to their careers uh, as archivists. So the big question of the day is, well, why certification? And I've talked about kind of how we function as the Academy, and I've talked about sort of some of the things we're trying to do with our mission, uh, and it all comes down to this uh, sort of really important piece which is to try to make our profession as best as possible. And the way we've seen our kind of niche in um, the many different great regional societies, uh, national societies such as SAA and international groups is to kind of challenge people. And, and what I mean by challenge is um, ask our members to do some, some different type of work uh, to per, sort of demonstrate their knowledge. And part of that is the exam. Um, the other part is the certification, uh, the recertification process. And so one thing members go through after you've passed um, a certification exam, the first time is you go through a recertification process. Now you can sit for that exam again, if you would like. Um, I chose not to sit for the exam. I, while I don't have testing anxiety, uh, tests of course generate a lot of anxiety for any kind of uh, people. So I choose to pre-certify by petition. And essentially what that process is, is sort of, going through and demonstrating you've maintained uh, a current knowledge of the field, you've sort of participated in making our field better by participation in um, various regional groups, national groups, international groups, maybe you've done some teaching uh, both to uh, individuals in your home institution, individuals in your community, to archival students, um, as well as do other work for the academy and mentorship and things like that. And that's really sort of a key feature of certification. On the one hand, the exam does sort of prove at that initial moment when you pass that, hey, you can say you know what you're talking about. But the recertification means you're maintaining a commitment 
to the field and you're saying, I've gone out and tracked kind of the activities I've done to help our field uh, get better, grow, become more diverse, uh, more inclusive, and how we've gone about just sort of making things better. Uh, in terms of sort of key things we like to say about the field and kind of get down to some, uh, you know, we'll use the, the old term brass tacks here, is it does sort of validate what you know. Um, I found myself really relieved when I passed the test the first time. I'm like, oh, I guess I did actually know what I'm talking about. I'm sitting here in a position as an archivist in an academic library. You know, when you're first uh, on the field, you think, oh, do I know? Do I not know? How can I prove themselves? You run into these issues where you feel like you're an imposter and you're suffering from imposter syndrome. Well, that CA at the end of your name is really useful to helping you say, you know what? I do know what I'm doing, talking about. And somebody else who's done a lot of work in this and done a lot of thought in this agrees that I know what I'm talking about. It's just that validation. Also, there's an added benefit on the job market. Uh, lots of different organizations or their academic business uh, do find the CA uh, as an attractive uh, feature to a resume. And it helps uh, make you stand out from other applicants into um, uh, a, uh, a, a, a for positions uh, included in this is also is this idea that you're sort of testing yourself against um, uh, consensus national standard. Uh, this is quasi international. I don't like to kind of say completely international, but we're kind of getting there. Uh, where you know members of your field have gone out and spent a lot of time and energy thinking about. Um, what are the important aspects of archival work? And I've done a lot of different of these processes in the academy to say that we spend a lot of time thinking about this from making the exam to thinking about um, what we call the RDS, and I'll talk about that later uh, as well. And then we've also, last but certainly not least, we have evidence that suggests that when a active archivist gets uh, their certification that it also can help improve pay, uh, can help with promotion and tenure. I went through that process. Uh, last year, and it helped with my promotion and tenure process. So I was pretty happy with that, maintaining my certification. I've gone through promotion and tenure twice, and it's helped with both times. So I've been pretty happy with it uh, from that respect. So in terms of kind of our demographics, and we do need to update these a little bit, we have members from all over, I guess you could say the archival spectrum, uh, from museums to government institutions to corporate archives um, and, and, and kind of beyond. And I think this brings up a sort of a strong suit that we, our perspective isn't an extremely narrow perspective. We try to represent our membership and our membership is diverse uh, and in, in terms of the archives that they work for. So let's get down to kind of the first part of becoming uh, connected to the uh, uh, sort of becoming a certified archivist, and that's figuring out how you qualify. So I'm actually going to start at the end and talk about option four and five, because if you have not applied for certification or have not previously taken the, the test, these options really don't apply. Most of the options I imagine for most of the people in this group are going to be options one to three. Option four and five uh, are specific options for people who have uh, already filled out their application, have been approved to take the exam, but for some reason, and especially in this, this time of COVID, uh, weren't able to pass, and we completely understand that. And so we have a way for those individuals to retake and resit through the exam um, uh, just by paying the examination fee. Uh, we'll talk about fees a little bit. Uh, option five, um, we've had a number of people defer over the last two years, um, and we glad understand completely in the sort of period of time we're in with stresses of the world uh, and, and, and different types of scenarios. So we have a process for that. And basically for either option four or five, you just need to email um, our secretary at, at ACA um, at caphill.com just to, to talk with them and set that up. So if that applies to you, uh, you can email Mike, who's our secretary at directly and, and set up your process. Now for everyone else, uh, we have a couple of different options. And so the reality is in our field is there are archivists who don't necessarily have an archival degree. There are archivists who may have some education in archive and a uh, degree. And I should say these are all graduate degrees. And then there are archivists who have a degree really very specific in archives with a, a, an intense concentration. And because of that, we sort of have three different options uh, to go through to sort of sit for the exam. We do require the graduate degree to sit for the certified archivist exam, at least now. There is conversations about 
uh, what that might look like in the future. Um, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but as of now, um, we do require a uh, master's degree. So if you have a master's degree um, and it's been a very focused degree that has a lot of archival credits, at least nine credit hours, so three courses on a semester-based system, uh, you can sit for the exam and then if you've already had work experience of one year, um, it, once you pass the exam, you'll be considered a full member of the academy. Um, if you have a master's degree of any kind, um, you can sit for the exam. So this is you've already passed it, you've already got a master's degree, you've been working in the field for a number of years. Uh, you can sit for the exam um, if you've got two years of professional experience. And so that's without any kind of archival course credit. Uh, and then option three, which is really more for those uh, immediately outside of the uh, sort of their graduate um, education. So let's say you're going to graduate in May. Um, you would need to prove that you had nine credit hours of courses, which I'm sure is going to be very easy for, for most of us, uh, for most people finishing degree programs to, uh, now. Uh, and then you have an extended period of time to complete that sort of work requirement. And so essentially what we're, we're demonstrating here to sit for the exam, we want to so, see that you've got an education, graduate uh, or otherwise, um, we like to see some archival education, if at all possible, but we're not ruling people out who don't. Uh, and then as part of sort of your requirement to sort of be a complete uh, certified archivist or, or, or not just a provisional, we do have a provisional membership, we want to see some work experience because we acknowledge that archival work is, yes, theory and is education, but it is also that sort of practice and experiential part. And, and we want to sort of connect our certification both with the theoretical and the practical at the same time. So three options, three different approaches. If you're the key here, I like to emphasize is students right out of a graduate program, you have a number of years to get that sort of uh, 1750 uh, or 1750 hours of work. This is basically a full time work for a year. Um, three years allows you to do part time work and get the, the full hours that way, too. Uh, I know chat questions are coming in. Um, and I was told to wait till the end. And we'll in the we'll look at those that but I see a number of them have come in. So moving right along. Uh, when you go for uh, to sit for the exam, you do you need to uh, apply. Now, our application process is entirely online. Um, I'm sharing a link at the end of the presentation where you can see all the information about how to apply and all, everything I've talked about kind of today. Um, sometimes there are going to be supplemental information that you need to send. Uh, this might this will include transcripts. We do look at transcripts for graduate degrees, um, and all of those can be sent to ACA at Cap Hill. Um, for that. And then if you already have, and this can be a bit of a sticking point for some people, but it's not super complicated. Uh, we want to sort of have some evidence that you have been working and uh, that working sort of evidence can be either a letter from HR. I usually say just ask your supervisor to write a letter saying this person has worked here from this point to this point um, with date ranges to give us sort of this idea that you've been working for either the one year or the, the, to, to the equivalent of the 1,750 hours. Now, there are a couple of fees, and I told you we would come about, we would come to this. Uh, there is an initial application fee, and this mostly is to handle our cost for running the applications through our online application system. We use a, pro, uh, a, a program called Prolidian to help us do this. Um, so that non-refundable fee is $75. Uh, part of that is the test taking fee because our test is an, an online test. Uh, if you have already previously applied and not um, uh, passed the exam or you've deferred, you may have to pay a $30 uh, testing fee just because it costs us every time we have to do, uh, every time we give someone access to a test. Uh, once you have succeeded in your um, uh, exam and passed your exam, there is a certification fee after that and that just covers your first year um, dues and, and gets you kind of set up uh, to be ready to be a member of the academy. So quick notes, I sort of mentioned these all already, just as a reminder, uh, we do look for a master's degree, um, whether with one year or, or two years qualifying experience. Uh, 
quick note though too is, and I mentioned this earlier, if you're right out of a graduate program and we know you may not have the work requirements, we um, allow you to come in as a provisional member until you get those work requirements. So if you've just graduated, you're working on getting all of your hours and um, uh, worked in, uh, that's where you go. And I may have to check on this real quick. That is a, a, a lower charge than the full $75, which is our normal thing. I think that's $50 and I needed to, one thing I forgot to look up before I came in here uh, this afternoon. And again, if you're provisional, you have the three years to earn um, that one year of professional experiences, and then you don't have to pay dues until you're certified. I think that's what I was trying to remember. So you don't have to pay that certification fee. Um, you just pay the exam fee. We make you provisional member. So um, when we talk about qualifying experience, and I know I saw this question come through a moment ago, and I know we'll have a lot of questions at the end to, 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 to look at, is we typically do look at professional experience. So we are looking for that sort of title of archivist or working directly at, in archives. Now this could be part-time work. We have not traditionally taken internship work um, as, as being this because internship work is considered um, sort of training work. Uh, I know that's one thing we've been having a lot of debates about, but as, as, as current policy is, it's typically work where you designate it as an archivist. It can be part-time, um, but um, again, that's sort of the policy demonstrated right now. That's sort of the, the principal thinking is that we we're certifying archivist um, uh, in terms of their sort of professional work experience. Um, one of the things, of course, we're looking at is when we're talking about this experience is just the ethics of being an archivist, um, application of the archival principles in work, um, working as that sort of archivist um, and, and being sort of service oriented, oriented as you're, you're going about your work. Okay, so moving on just a little bit, um, I wanna talk about kind of how we cover the sort of knowledge that we test in the exam. And we really have um, eight domains, soon to be nine domains as we're finalizing a couple of different pieces uh, of where we sort of test um, information um, related to archives. We do have a general domain that sort of sets the stage of sort of general ideas that may be associated with one of the seven major domains, uh, but we pull all of our questions and base them um, on these seven. So selection, appraisal, acquisition, um, arrangement, description, reference, preservation, outreach, managing, and professional ethical and legal responsibilities. In terms of the exam, we have questions in each one of these domains, and um, they can kind of vary widely in things they're asking. Some may be hyper-specific if you're thinking about preservation in terms of preservation standards, temperature, humidity, or they may be a little more... Um, uh, and I don't want to say out there, that's a bad, bad phrasing in this situation. Uh, they might be more, I don't want to say esoteric, but theoretical in talking about um, major ideas in archival theory and practice, such as um, if you're planning a outreach program, you know, what's your major starting focus? Usually your major starting focus is your mission of your organization, things like that. Uh, and of course, they kind of run the gamut. And that to me, you know, and I've taken the exam trying to think, oh, I have to know all of these seven areas um, is a bit daunting, but I think it's uh, useful to, to sort of test yourself in some respects uh, to try to think about what you know from all these different areas. And I know for a fact, I think I borked the outreach section when I graded because you will get a score that demonstrates how you did between each domain. Uh, funny thing enough, I was doing a lot of reference and outreach work at the time and I still messed up my section. It wasn't as good of a score as I thought it was going to be. So that happens to the best of us. Uh, I love a little graphic here to just kind of remind ourselves about um, where we're trying to think of our different um, roles. I don't always believe the work of archives is necessarily circular going in one thing. I think it's more amorphous, but essentially we're just covering the entirety of the work we do. So when I talk about our knowledge statements and tasks, which we also refer to as our world delineation statements, our, our RDS, if you get deep into the, the academy speak, 
um, is really related to a few different things. So first I mentioned we have these general knowledge statements. Uh, and then within each domain, such as the ones I showed earlier, we have knowledge statements or things we think you should know as an archivist, and then tasks, things that we usually do as an archivist. Now, we're not saying you'll know everything, and we're not saying you will do everything, but as, the, as we have sort of looked at the work of archives, we determined that you should know or we think you should know generally these sort of ideas. And then we think typically archivists do these sort of activities um, uh, in their work or may do some of these activities in their work. So that's really sort of the breakdown of the RDS. So a note on the exam. So we our application period is two months long. So we started on March 1st, uh, we ended on April 30th. Um, the exam is online. And we have uh, several test days for the exam. Uh, so we run from June 9th to the 11th with different exam periods during the day um, in an online exam. This is a proctored exam. Uh, we've been using Zoom the last couple of years and I predict that's how we'll go about this year. Typically what that means is you'll go into an exam room, there'll be a proctor there, you'll probably have to turn on your, your webcam um, and uh, someone will kind of monitor different breakout rooms as you're taking the exam. And this is just to ensure no one is, you know, doing anything nefarious. We don't want to see any cheating, things like that. We don't expect to see it, but it's the reason we proctor it just as a, as a, a sort of a safety net. Uh, the question, the exam is a hundred questions. Uh, occasionally we may add in test questions. They do not count against you. They are our attempt to uh, try to figure out if some of our questions are good questions, and typically they'll be at the end of the exam. Uh, you have three hours to complete 100 questions, um, which is a fair amount of time. Most people finish way before that three hour allotment uh, is over. Uh, and uh, the exam is multiple choice, um, just as a FYI. So there are, mentioned the fees earlier um, a little bit, but the certification fee is $75. And then you also have, uh, once you pass the exam, and then um, now our annual dues are $75 as of uh, this year. So I mentioned this earlier uh, when we talked about what I think are sort of one of the major things about being a member of the academy. Like the exam is kind of the first hurdle you jump. But to me, it's really about recertification. And that's all about kind of looking at your work as an archivist and sort of thinking about all the things you've done either to make yourself a better archivist or to help the field. And um, as I said earlier, you can take the exam again. If you like taking tests, please sit for the exam. Um, I thought about that one year and then I decided, you know what, no. <laughs> uh, mostly because I was on the committee that made the exam and I was like, that's not really fair. Uh, most of our, um, our uh, uh, members do by petition. And essentially what you do when you recertify by petition is you track certain things. So you get X number of points for being a member of a committee. You get X number of points for attending a workshop. You get X number of points for writing something and publishing it uh, in a variety of different forms from blogs to professional blogs to um, uh, journal articles in, in the gamut. You get uh, points for exhibits. You get points for teaching. Uh, I've always been really lucky because I'm an educator. I've been an educator for the last six years. I get a lot of points because I teach a lot of classes because that's what I do. But I also got points for teaching workshops. And you get points if you teach a longer workshop, you get sort of more points. And I've taught some uh, multi-week workshops um, before that were a lot of fun. And those are really great experiences um, uh, as well. And the sum up of all this, and especially from my perspective, as I was sitting there and doing my last certification, which I'm coming up in a couple of years on my next one, is it made me feel really good. It made me look at my work as an archivist, even more than doing, you know, the academic stuff where we go through promotion and tenure, that's, that's stressful. Recertification, I think, is a lifting experience because it makes you think, oh, I've engaged with some workshops, so I've learned some new things. Or I have gone out and I've shared what I know about being an archivist to other people. Or I've tried to make my profession better by being an officer in an organization or being a committee member of an organization or doing something with the academy. And it, to me, this is where I think the benefit is, is sort of a little bit of extra external pressure saying, hey, we want you to go out there and do good work. And we're going to kind of watch you and make 
sure you're you're up there and you're you're participating in it and then we're going to reward you with this great thing uh known as being a certified archivist i should mention we're coming out with linkedin badges um, this year so soon we'll be able to populate people's linkedin page with a really lovely little little badge that can show off that you're a member of the academy but to me this is really my my favorite part is the recertification a uh, couple of quick notes. Um, we do have a lot of different information on our website, namely our acaconnect.peridian.com, and I'll share this link in chat um, when we finish up in a few moments, just so everybody has it. We're in the process of moving to a website, so that's why it's sort of a weird URL, um, but this is the most up-to-date information. This is also where you will apply to sit for the exam. Um, we have various awards and uh, monetary things that we can use. Uh, we you have a what we used to be a legacy reward, which is a travel award, but we've shifted it into more of just a useful um, monetary award we can hand out to members of the ACA to go to any kind of workshop. Previously, it, as I said, it was just for going to uh, SAA meetings. Now it's going to be more, can we give you to go to a workshop, local, national, anything like that. Um, we also have our award information, ACA News. Um, regularly, we pr produce a, uh, some commentary. And then, of course, we're going to have some member portals coming online, hopefully, in the next couple of months. So big questions, of course. If you have questions, you can uh, contact um, the Academy uh, at ACA uh, Cap Hill, or you can reach out to me, and I'm happy to answer a lot of questions. Um, as well. And I know there's a bunch of questions coming through the chat. And so I will maybe stop sharing and answer some of those. Um, one kind of quick thing before we, we end, um, uh, we do have study materials. So previously we've had something called the handbook. We've done away with the handbook. Now we have a study guide um, as well as that study guide just kind of helps you think through the RDS, all the knowledge, uh, the knowledge statements and the tasks that I mentioned earlier gives you our suggested list of readings, as well as space to kind of take notes, define terms and do some other things like that. And that's available on our, our website as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then try to process all of the questions that have come through. So I'm going to go start at the and beginning. We'll start recording. Thank you okay. very much, Joshua. It's much appreciated. Um, it's uh, quite enjoy enjoy the presentation really. Thank you. Thank you again. So I'm so stopping the recording.